Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, High Tech Okie, Chris Zaragoza, Jim Hart, and Nathan Anderson, and all of you. On this episode of DTNS, Apple open sources its on-device AI. Qualcomm is ready to take on Apple's M chip and thinks it can outperform it. Plus, why Meta is trying to get companies to use its VR operating system on their hardware. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 24th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm today's producer, Amos. Amos, what are you doing here? <laughs> what have you what? done with Roger Chang? <laughs> <laughs> Roger's back there behind the scenes doing doing some other stuff. We're uh, mm-hmm. Joe's going out of town, so we had to, to switch some stuff around uh, and and get some get some things in place before he does. So Joe is also here too, silently judging all of us while we do the show. Well, with <laughs> Amos, we're you in capable know. hands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Let's start with the quick hits. The President of the United States signed a bill on Wednesday that requires ByteDance to divest, a.k.a. sell, the U.S. subsidiary that operates TikTok there within nine months. If it doesn't, tech companies in the U.S. will be prohibited from distributing the app. That would be TikTok. ByteDance says it will ask a court to rule that the new law violates the U.S. First Amendment protections against abridging freedom of speech. If you missed Monday's show, Tom and Justin broke down what the law means, how the court challenge may play out. So definitely give that a listen if you haven't already. And there's a know a little more about ByteDance at knowalittlemore.com uh, as well if you want to know actually what the ownership is like and all of that stuff. Windows 11 users will start to see recommendations for apps from the Windows Store in the Start menu. Uh, you'll see these described as ads, which in a way I suppose they are, but Microsoft is picking the recommendations as a way to encourage developers. It does not appear they are featuring apps because of payments, at least not yet. You can disable the recommendations in the personalization settings in Windows. I have to assume a lot of people will be doing that. But, Mm. you know, we'll see. Google, definitely still intending to eliminate third-party cookies from the Chrome browser. Oh boy, we've been doing this dance for a while. Something that Safari and Firefox, among other browsers, have already eliminated. Google has intended to do this for years now, was supposed to do it finally at the end of this year, but it's not going to. You say, why? Well, because of ongoing challenges related to reconciling divergent feedback from the industry regulators and developers, says Google. Uh, The company would be uh, easy to interpret, uh, you know, doing that as dragging its feet to please advertisers, and that probably is playing a part. But the UK Competition and Markets Authority and Information uh, Commissioner's Office have also told Google that its plan to eliminate third-party tracking in Chrome did not go far enough. Google may legitimately need more time to accommodate the changes requested by them. In fact, the CMA welcomed the announcement of the delay as it will give Google time to plug gaps in the plan that might have allowed advertisers to track users anyway. Yeah. So those of you who are like, oh, the advertisers made them delay. Not this time. The regulators. The regulators made them delay this time. Interesting. Swedish payments company Klarna has reached a deal with Uber to provide payment services for Uber in Germany, Sweden, and the United States. Klarna offers payment installment services, you know, buy now, pay later, BNPL. With Uber, however, it will use its pay now option, which pays for an entire order with a single click. Although in Germany and Sweden, you can bundle your Uber payments into one sum that can be removed from a monthly paycheck. However, you cannot buy your Uber ride and pay later. It doesn't go into the BNPL stuff. Oh, man. All right. If the drawing of a hand holding an Apple pencil on the invite to Apple's May 7th announcement wasn't enough of a hint, Tim Cook wrote on X, quote, pencil us in for May 7th. And He used a pencil emoji. So yeah, there will probably be the first new Apple Pencil since 2018, announced on May 7th at the iPad event. Indeed. All right, let's talk about an actually interesting Apple release that's happening now, for real. Yeah, so Apple is getting into the AI party, uh, among many companies, with something called Open ELM, that's short for Open Source Efficient Language Models. That's a new family of open source 
LLMs, that can run on device. Ah, that's key for Apple, rather than in the cloud. Although there are eight, uh, uh, altogether, there are eight open ELM models, four are pre-trained, four are instruction-tuned, and cover parameter sizes between 270 million and 3 billion. Apple is offering the weights of its open ELM models under what it says is a sample code license. That's along with different checkpoints from training, uh, statistics on how the models perform, and also instructions for pre-training, evaluation, instruction tuning, parameter efficient fine tuning. Uh, A lot of this stuff sounds a little gobbledygook, but... I think, you know, the big takeaway here is Apple is often not first to this sort of thing, um, but we've been hearing rumblings about uh, Apple uh, really, you know, taking whatever Siri is now up several notches. Um, And, you know, we've got uh, iOS uh, 18 coming, we've got new iPhones coming this year, um, and all, you know, all signs point to... Um, the LLM being a big part of this. Yeah, the, we've been covering the cadence of Apple's uh, open sourcing and publishing of academic research, uh, which has been a constant drumbeat since the middle of last year. Uh, so Apple is very clearly showing off their prowess at small, focused, large language models. I mean, they're small. Uh, as much as a large language model can be small. Uh, they're, they're small for the large size, if that makes any sense. Uh, but they are efficient. They are almost always on device, and they are all pointing to being integrated in way more ways than just Siri in the next version of iOS and probably Mac OS, iPad OS, TV OS, watch OS, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, I think are going to see a big big emphasis, bigger than everybody's even been expecting on AI at WWDC. And they're telling you right now with all of these publications and open sourcings, what the capabilities are. So if you really want to string all this stuff together, you probably get a pretty good idea of how Apple's going to combine all this stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, pretty excited to hear about this. As as it turns out, my, my uh, desire is more on device AI functionality. And I know that's you know, a big push for Apple, given their security stance. Um, they, you know, it's a big sales position for them, but I also, I also like it. I like, I like good security. Um, the concern is, you know, people say, well, you can't really have really good AI uh, generative models of any kind, uh, text or otherwise, if you don't have a good cloud infrastructure to run it. And while they're not obviously saying no cloud infrastructure at all, they're going to want to focus on on device stuff. My answer to that is, in not too many years, we're going to have chips uh, capable of doing a lot more on device. Maybe not everything, but a lot more on device than we were before. And I'd just be more comfortable with it. Like, I'm not paranoid about AI, but I know it goes out and it learns and it scrapes and it spreads and it does all the things that it does. And that's fine. That's the way that thing works. But for a lot of that stuff, I just needed to work well on a device. And if it's my iPhone, great. Uh, yeah, and I think that that's what Apple's been been trying to position itself to say is we are the privacy company, and how would yeah. we be able to make sure that your information is private if we're constantly sending it to some server? Uh, that's why we got really good at on-device AI. And if you look at all the research they've been publishing, if you look at these eight models that they just released, they are all claiming to be efficient at on device that they can use small parameters to do things. Now, these are pre-trained and instruction tuned, like Sarah said, which means they are narrower in what they can do. But that's been something that I've been noticing as a trend as well, which is these large language models are not that great when you have them be multi-purpose and try to do everything. They get a lot better when you focus them. Well, and that is, I mean, I guarantee you, well, I don't guarantee you because I don't work at Apple, but I'm going to venture a guess that at WWDC, Apple will hammer home these points of this is why you want these LLMs to be in your pocket, as it were. This is this is what it's good for. This is why we care about your privacy, et cetera, mm. et cetera. You know, the the whole sort of like it can do everything in the cloud. That is what Apple is going to buck the trend on and be like, what are you really using this for? 
four or five things on a daily basis, great. We've got you covered. Yeah, we'll, we'll be able to train it on your data, on your device in a focused manner uh, with instruction tuned uh, situations so it doesn't stray out and do other things. I, I think it's fascinating. The other argument I hadn't really thought about until just now is they can also make an environmental argument that when you're using a, a model on your device, you're not oh, using it in Apple a power hungry data to do center. That. Yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah. yeah mm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, saving power, uh, one of the things that Apple is best at saving power with is their M processors, the M1, M2, M3, and the forthcoming M4. They're all super power efficient, super powerful. I almost sometimes forget to plug in my MacBook because I'm so used to not having to plug in my MacBook. Qualcomm wants to get in on that for Windows machines and has announced the Snapdragon X Plus, which uses the same Orion CPU as the Snapdragon X Elite, which Qualcomm announced back in October. These are both chips meant to power Windows-based machines, but using ARM designs. And Microsoft has gotten much better at operating Windows on ARM processors than they did back in the Windows RT days years ago. The Snapdragon X Plus, is a smaller version of the Elite. It has 10 cores instead of 12, has 3.4 gigahertz clock speed rather than 3.8. Uh, in Qualcomm's benchmarks, it ranked 2,000 points lower than the Elite, so it's close, but it matched an NPU performance, which powers AI models, so they think it'll be just as good at on-device AI. Qualcomm also claims they are more power efficient than the Intel Core Ultra 7 and AMD Ryzen 9 chips, and that they outperform the Apple M3. However, there's a little controversy brewing about these benchmarks. Qualcomm has not shared a lot of details about them. They haven't been very transparent. And semiaccurate.com alleges that a couple of OEM sources and a source within Qualcomm have been telling them that the numbers Qualcomm has shown aren't achievable at the settings they claim. So that there's something fishy about these details that they have released. No independent testing has been done on the parts yet. So we're, we're actually waiting for parts to arrive. In fact, no Snapdragon X Plus or Elite devices have been announced yet. We're likely to get the first of them from Microsoft, they are expected to make a consumer announcement about Surface devices in May, and those are supposedly going to all be ARM-based, and this is probably going to mean they run on Snapdragon X processors. And then after that, Computex takes place in Taiwan on June 4th, and we're probably going to get a ton of manufacturers announcing their Snapdragon X-based laptops and machines when that happens. My question for you, you all is... Uh, if these pan out and can be even as good as the Apple M series processors, what will that mean when you've got all these various manufacturers and various form factors that Windows provides? I would hope that means prices go down. Mm, that Maybe. would be a nice thing for it to mean. That would be a nice. I, I mean, that's like that's my you know, my first thought is and it probably okay, would right? Yeah, competition. Yeah. You know, you're not paying a premium for something that another company can provide. Or maybe you're paying a premium for both, but prices should go down as an effect. At least prices of the Windows machines, would you would have cheaper alternatives. I'm not sure if it would bring the MacBook down because Apple just doesn't work that way. But yeah, yeah. you would have more affordable options. Yeah, yeah. I also think, um, I, I, I agree with that. I think competition is good in the chip space regardless. But I also have become a complete and total utter convert to the ARM architecture way of doing things. I didn't believe in this case, Apple, when they were touting silicon the first time, the M1 chips ended up with an M1 Mini to sort of as cheaply as possible. Oh, that's see right. what I thought. And you loved it. I loved that thing. I've now upgraded to a studio um, with a Max chip in there, and it's even there's even more love to give, it turns out. The thing is, it's not even an Apple love thing I'm feeling about this. I just think they are so power efficient, fast, and for what I do, which is a lot of audio, video, and art production stuff, it is a world's difference from where I used to run around with my Intel world. I, I have to imagine that if you're a PC purist or you're somebody who is just, you know, as much in that Windows 11 world as you can possibly be, I'm telling you right now, this is something you want. I hope that all goes this way. I'm not saying that Intel is gone. I'm saying Intel needs to shift gears too. And I think ARM is not only here to stay, but uniquely suited for tasks today that we weren't even thinking about 10 years ago and doing them better and more efficiently. And I'm I'm in love with ARM chips. I'll just say it. I'm going to marry one after my wife you know, decides to leave me. <laughs> oh, congratulations. 
congratulations in advance, Scott. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I do have, you, you know, <laughs> the whole sort of like Qualcomm is inflating benchmarks and numbers uh, part of the story. I don't know how, I mean, that's going to matter to a certain person doing a, a, a specific thing. I don't know how much that's a real problem if, you know. I mean, it'll be a problem or it won't. That's my take on it. Yeah. Like, it kind of doesn't matter right now because we don't have the chips. Once the chips are out, we'll find out. Do they work well or do they not? And there's two there's two sides of that coin. One is, is Qualcomm right about the benchmarks and are they powerful and efficient? Because uh, if they're not, that'll be obvious real quick. And will Windows work well on them? Windows on ARM has gotten much better. It's very good at the translation layer. Uh, there are more native versions uh, like Dropbox and Chrome. Google making Chrome for ARM is a big step. Creative Cloud is available native on ARM. Uh, so that helps as well if you don't have to virtualize, if you don't have to translate. Uh, things run better. That's Definitely something that people on the M series Max have found is that, gosh, those native apps, they sure work better than the Rosetta Stone ones. The Rosetta Stone ones work fine, but the native ones work better. They always do, right? The universal apps are always the best, but it is funny. I have a very, very uh, strong recollection of the PowerPC to Intel conversion that we went through with Max back in the, what was it, 05, 06, whatever yeah, it was. Yeah. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. And it kind of was. Rosetta got the job done. Rosetta won, but it wasn't great. This time around, I was feeling the same anxiety. I'm like, oh, I got to deal with all this until people switch over. And I was shocked how much fa I was having faster speeds with Intel based Rosetta 2 conversions than I was with the Intel based version on an Intel box by itself. So I was getting an improved performance somehow over what it was normally. And then when native stuff started hitting and Universal Apps became the norm uh, for the most part, it was even that much better of a performer. So I want this experience for for windows i'm a windows user mostly on the gaming side of things but i would love to see uh more power efficient less giant fan blowing you know just a just a just a uh, what's the word just a more streamlined cpu performance on on pcs that is less based on something we've been doing forever um you know it may change the i come here with a lot of gaming information but it may change the the forecast for what game consoles end up being in the future could they be arm based at their core possibly i don't know but for whatever reason arm is just having a moment and it's great well folks uh one of the, the most popular operating systems on arm based machines is android and if you love following android if you're like why haven't you mentioned android in this show you have to listen to android faithful every week android aficionados ron richard twin twin dow michelle Rahman, and jason hell bring you the latest android news in a fun entertaining and informative way uh on the most recent show michelle cleared out his back catalog of stories it's like oh my gosh there's all this stuff i've been waiting to tell you about android and we we now have time so you got to check it out it is live on tuesdays 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific youtube.com slash daily tech news show uh, or you can subscribe and get it in your feed go do that at androidfaithful.com on monday's show we mentioned that meta will be licensing its meta horizon os to third-party av and vr hardware developers in initial hardware partners include Asus's ROG brand, Lenovo, Microsoft also in the mix, working on uh, stuff with Meta to create a limited addiction, uh, addition, maybe an addiction, uh, addition <laughs> Xbox branded Quest. Okay, Scott, I know you wanted to, to talk about this. Um, kind of, pretty big news over the last couple of days. A lot of people wondering what's going on here. Do you think Meta is trying to an Android here, getting its platform out on as many devices as possible so that it ends up being embedded in as many devices as possible. Well, it makes sense. I mean, the and the software has its roots in a fork of, of Android and Linux. I mean, it all goes back to these, these open source things. Um, but having them get out ahead of this and, and create a licensable product as an OEM software OS, I think is really smart for them and not just in a Android Google way or a Microsoft Windows way, which is a very similar model as well. Um, but in a kind of, hey, nobody else is doing this in VR sort of way. And I think there are a lot of really hardware-focused companies, certainly in Asia, who build uh, a lot of sensors and a lot of product that don't have a good software backend for it. Um, that, I think this was true for phones as well, and Android sort of solved that problem. 
or at least provi- provided one solution. This is another chance for that. So if I am a a, a really technical, uh, you know, big on the specs of the hardware headset maker, and I'm looking for either developing my own backend for things when it comes to OS and how to run the thing, or the option of having something that's more available to me and everywhere else, and somebody else is making sure it's up to date all the time. Uh, it, there's certain quality standards that you would expect out of that sort of thing, like we do with Android and Windows. Um, I think that that makes a ton of sense. Why wouldn't you do that? So I have a feeling you're going to see folks like Microsoft could be one, but I think you're going to see a lot of smaller uh, makers come to the table and go, look, I would really like to license Horizon for our headset. And it will become ubiquitous in the VR space, which is already a little bit small. And while it's small and brewing, it makes sense for Meta to capitalize on the idea that maybe we become the most licensed version of a VR OS. Let's become an OEM for all of these makers that are either making stuff now or potential makers. I think the potential is the one they're actually looking for. And it also gives me, the consumer, more choice when it comes to whose headset I want to buy. Um, The one interesting thing about this is, Tom mentioned this to me earlier, and I didn't realize this, but uh, not unlike the way it works with Android and their licensing program with Google, the store will be run by Meta. So it's a VR store full of VR stuff, but it's Meta's store. And I think that that makes sense for them too, obviously, for lots of revenue generation reasons. Um, but this helps them get out from underneath the sort of, well, if we don't sell a ton of headsets, then, then we're screwed. We can't, you know, if we don't dominate this industry uh, or if, if sales slow, we don't know what else to do. Well, one thing to do and to help the industry grow is to have, you yeah. know, have the back end. Feature VR headsets. Yeah. You know, yeah. that is do a, a couple things enough, really well. Is yeah. it a big enough market? Not yet. No, know. it's not yet. Yeah. That's my That's my only worry about it or my only concern is that, we're starting at a point, you know, they're starting at a point where they're they're the biggest name in terms of units sold. Um, and there's a lot of noise from competition like Apple's thing, which is very different than a VR headset anyway. But it doesn't matter. It's still sort of that's part of the zeitgeist. Um, and outside of that, there's not a lot of movement. Like we hear little things here and there about maybe Valve's got a, a new version of their thing coming. And, you know, there's all this sort of talk and uh, back and forth. But for the most part, one of the problems I think they all face meta included is this is a market that has kind of stalled or it hit a ceiling for a while and that ceiling is either a price competition thing or maybe it's a just well this is lack worth of it. that killer app yeah or if it's not thing. small enough i don't want a big old thing on my head like i know a lot of yeah. people still i don't use vr yeah. that the much apple vision it's pro is not the, the providing the halo effect that some people including myself thought it might uh, yeah. it, it is in fact declining as, as we mentioned earlier in the week. So I look at this and I'm like, yeah, it is very much like Android in a lot of ways. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, it is, it has got an open source base, but if you want the best version, you've got to license it from meta and get all the, the, the cool modules that make it work. But even great. that price point, I mean, if you compare it to Apple is like, I mean, it's not even oh, it's <laughs> competition, small. you yeah. know, it's like, that's where as a developer, I would want to, you know, let, let's go with meta on this one, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but what, what I was going to say is even even though it's got a lot of similarities with Android, I wonder if it isn't more similar with Palm. Mm. Palm oh, was licensed out to other uh, phone makers at a time when smartphones were just sort of taken off, but they hadn't become huge. Mm-hmm. And then we know what happened is you get iOS and Android later. Like, is it too early for Meta to be doing that? That's a really great question. I hadn't really thought about that because we, you know, we have historical tech examples of this sort of thing. Um, I think what makes this one unique is everybody felt like phones were not going away, but we didn't know, we just didn't know whose flag was going to be at the top of that mountain. Even before we heard about iOS or Android or whatever we called iOS before then, um, they just didn't, we didn't know, but we knew that's the direction it was going. I think these guys are kind of in the same boat. They know VR and AR are the future in some way. There's some part of our future in tech. How much, how little, we don't know, but you got to make decisions like this to sort of get ahead of it. And this may not be a bad one. Like it worked for Microsoft with PCs. It didn't work so much for Palm with handhelds, but it's working for Android now. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to predict these things, but I do feel like there's a good comparison there, Tom. I like that. I feel like it's a, it's a no lose situation for meta right now. Um, you know, yeah. it, it, it might, you know, become something where the company's like, eh, not, 
worth the, you know, hassle of working with all these, you know, other companies. But for now, for example, I am uh, subscribed to, you know, everything that like MetaQuest, you know, like the new cool apps that come to MetaQuest. Like I see that, you know, in my email every day. And, you know, most of the time I'm like, eh, whatever. I just like I do my three things on the quest, which I love. <laughs> yeah. Sure. But but another company can, you know, can kind of sling that to me in a different way and get me interested. And, you know, that's sort of the beauty of having various different companies that can give you more or less the same product, but, you know, with their own spin. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what I would like you to check out, Sarah? What's that, Tom? The mailbag. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, this one comes in from Howard. Howard says, one of the products that my company builds is a survey solution running on the Salesforce platform. We allow our customers to use Google's reCAPTCHA V3, which is what Tom described, where it detects things like human mouse movement or the gyroscope in your phone. Survey responses include a human confidence score so that actual humans taking the survey don't have to answer any questions, which would lower, lower the survey response rate. Simple Survey uses that to help people filter out those surveys, prevent duplicates, either generated from accidental double clicks or more commonly from email scammers that click every link to prevent phishing attacks through email. Howard says, honestly, I'm shocked that more companies don't do this. It's really easy to use, doesn't inconvenience humans, doesn't protect against farms of people filling up CAPTCHAs, as you mentioned yesterday. It's really about the right tool for the right job. Yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. Like you're going to use CAPTCHA to slow down uh, human bot farms. And, and they're not bots, but they're, they're farms of humans just filling out CAPTCHAs uh, because the human confidence score uh, is going to filter out all the actual bots, but it wouldn't combat uh, the human farms. But still, I feel like I feel like more uh, implementations of this would be better. And maybe it's a, a cost of implementation. Maybe it's simpler to cut and paste the CAPTCHA codes that exist rather than uh, adding reCAPTCHA from Google. I don't know. Uh, it, it seems like the reCAPTCHA that Howard's talking about isn't that much overhead to implement. So uh, I'm surprised as well, Howard. And thanks for sharing the insight on how this works. Really appreciate that. I had a weird uh, experience earlier today where I was filling out a CAPTCHA and it was one of these ones saying, click on all the ones where the buses are. It's a very traditional CAPTCHA yeah, sure. method. <laughs> yes. And I sat there going, I know that right now AI is good enough that it could see my screen and tell all where all the buses are. This is a waste of my time. Like they, we have to get out mm -hmm. ahead of this thing. It's not entirely related to what the emailer is talking about, but it was just in my mind. I'm like, this is no longer, this doesn't work. Computers and then you can do failed. This. Then you failed to find all the buses and we're like, wait, <laughs> maybe I am an AI. <laughs> maybe. Also some of these, that, that wall looked like a bus. I mean, what are you going to do? Well, then, and then maybe we get into a point where it's like, are you a human? Because you're probably going to get this capture wrong. <laughs> if you're AI, AI you're going right. to ace it. Yeah. yeah, we talked about that <laughs> yesterday on GDI, too. That's Interesting funny. point. Uh, well, thanks to everybody who writes in feedback for us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your email. Thank you in advance. And thank you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. Uh, let us know where we can keep up with your latest work. Well, as my dad used to say, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, thanks for having me once again. If you're looking for cool stuff, I would head on over to frogpants.com slash core in particular, because core is a video game podcast all about the gaming world. Everything from big business goings on all the way down to little indies we're playing that week and everything in between. We got a show coming up on Thursday. And uh, we'd love to have you there. Um, I'm going to be in Vegas next week, part, uh, partially on, we'll be on this show on Monday, actually. Very excited about that. Uh, but we'll be doing it remotely from Las Vegas. So to all those who are coming, I just wanted to say I can't wait to see you guys. Yeah, I can't wait to see you in, in real life, too, Scott. Yeah, me and you. Yeah. We don't get to see each other that often. It's like maybe yeah, once, like twice a year. Yeah, like when have you high-fived in person last? Well, last Vegas, year. Vegas last year. Last year. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Once yeah. a year. This you know, it. that's a this start. That's a chance. Yeah. yeah, we get man hugs out of the way and all of it. Oh, it's yeah, great. all of it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, wait. folks, yeah, yeah uh, Scott and Brian Ibbett will both be on Daily Tech News Show on Monday, so stay tuned for that. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. There's a uh, 
Pentagon.com column uh, claiming that there are some really interesting examples of why LLM is not conscious, that doesn't, isn't able to consider itself. Uh, and one of them they put forth is that apparently a lot of models can't name a particular Gilligan's Island episode when you ask them. We're going to talk about that. Stick around. Oh, boy. I don't think I can either, but I'm not an LLM. That's at least what my mom tells me. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow, talking about on-demand streaming fatigue with Nika Monford and Charlotte Henry joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>